So welcome back everybody to another free um, online Bristol Zoological Society conservation lecture. Um, and tonight um, we've got a really special lecture from uh, Dr. João Vitor Campos Silva, um, affectionately known to his friends as Ajotabe, um, and who, who heads up um, an organization called Instituto Juruá, which you're going to hear all about tonight. Um, okay, so let's see what I've said. It's going to be recorded. Please um, leave your videos and microphones off for now. There'll be time at the end of the lecture, as always, for questions. Um, as, as everybody always is, please be nice to one another. Um, please be nice to our, to our speaker. Um, and that's about it. So without further ado, uh, Jotabe, um, it's it's all yours. Do you want to do you want to share your presentation? Yes, sure. Thank you very much, Mark, for this invitation. I'm super happy to be here to share some experience from from Brazil, and I'm especially happy to do that because uh, I'm going to show some uh, positive. Uh, histories from Brazilian Amazonia, uh, where we can align um, the protection of biodiversity with the local well-being. So thank you very much for this invitation. I will share my, my screen. Let me see. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, um, yes, we can see it. That's perfect. Yeah. Okay. So basically, the idea is to to share with you um, the importance of local communities for a sustainable future for for Amazonia. You know, when we talk about Amazonia, even in Brazil, people used to to think. In a, in a place with a very high biodiversity, sometimes a pristine, a pristine uh, environment, um, forests and animals with different colors and size and shapes. And, and all this is true, of course. Amazonia is a, it's a, it's like a, a, a biodiversity island with many, many species. But also uh, another point very important in, in, in Amazonia is regarding the cultural uh, diversity. So uh, in the forest, we have a very high uh, cultural diversity, indigenous peoples, and also uh, a mixed population that we used to, to call as Ribeirinhos. In, in Brazil, and this is a, a, a key part of the Amazonia. Um, we, at, for example, only in, in Brazil, we have more than 274 languages, uh, which is used by uh, 316 groups of indigenous people. So this is a, a um, a very important place in the world where we still can find um, indigenous groups living in a deep relation with the nature. Just some photos to illustrate the, the local way of life, which is based on harvesting of uh, forest products, fishing, and also hunting. And, and these indigenous groups and, and traditional communities have been uh, um, establishing a, a very deep relation with, with nature since millennia ago. So they developed um, a different uh, outlook for the place, different backgrounds, different skills, to manage, to handle with, with the nature. So the cultural, the cultural uh, 
is very, very important to understand pathways towards a, 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 a future, a sustainable futures, and with more um, social justice in Amazonia. So, due to this high biodiversity value and this high cultural diversity value, Amazon is a unique place um, which provides lots of uh, ecosystem services for the human being. And therefore, we have like a, go a global responsibility for, for Amazonia. But also, Amazonia is also immersed in a sea of threats, including deforestation. For example, we, we, we lose around 2,200 hectares per day of forest um, per year. And this estimate was before the current president of Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro. And so the, the situation is even worse at this moment in terms of Amazonia conservation. Uh, rates of deforestation has increased more than 206% in the, in the Bolsonaro agenda. But it's not about only deforestation, but also about mining. For example, we expect to increase the mining activities in Amazonia in five-fold and also the construction of large dams. We have almost 300 dams planted uh, in Amazonia. And also the defaulation and over-exploitation, -exploit which is a very important threat, hard to detect, to detect because you cannot uh, see the defaulation and over-exploitation through satellite images. So, um, the overexploitation is occurring in Amazonia, and and sometimes it's very very neglected process. And especially in terms of the megafauna, we have some exam examples here. For example, the Amazonian manatees, a large fishes uh, such as tambaqui, which is a frugivore fish very important for local economy and local ecology. Also the giant arapaima, which is a, a very emblematic species. And, and the piraiba, which is the largest catfish on, on earth. And queixada. So in this context, when where we have a high biodiversity, high cultural diversity, and lots of threats, how can we put together people and nature in the same package? This is one of the most important question uh, to think new uh, development pathways for, for Amazonia. Uh, we have been working in this question uh, through science and also uh, through conservation interventions in our organization. And here I would like to share some results um, that are very interesting. You know, protected area are the cornerstones of, of conservation in Amazonia. It's the major uh, strategy, very important. When we, we see the map of Amazonia, we can think, well, we have many protected areas, so we are well protected. But in fact, most of these uh, protected areas are not implemented. Uh, here we can see that um, considering the minimum level of implementation, which was estimated in terms of human resource funding and infrastructure, only one protected area in the state of Amazonas is well implemented. Most of them has uh, less than 30% of the, the implementation. So this is a, a clear case where we have a, a paper park narrative. And for example, in the Amazonas state, we have only three employees to manage 42 protected areas. So basically uh, we cannot depend of the protected area system of the Brazilian protected area system uh, to ensure 
the protection of the Amazon forest. So in this context, what can we do? So in this point, we start to talk about the participatory conservation, which is a, a, an important strategy that has been used worldwide. And it's about like the decentralization of the conservation through the empowerment of local communities. Uh, these examples of, of participatory uh, conservation can be found on co-management or community-based management literature. And this here, uh, uh, here we will show our uh, project at Churua River, which is a, a very interesting natural experiment. So the idea, we have uh, almost 2000 kilometers of a whitewater, very productivity river, where we have hundreds of local communities and four uh, protected areas. And the idea in this place is to build a river-based conservation model, model, ensuring welfare and biodiversity protection beyond the protected areas, the formal protected areas borders. And this is a very uh, special place in Amazonia because it was seen of a silent social revolution. Before, uh, during the, the rubber exploitation, local communities used to live in almost a, a slavery condition. But then they started a process of self-organization and now they are very well organized in local communities with very successful cases of, of uh, co-management of natural resources. And uh, they used to live in a very diverse set of, of livelihoods, including extraction of rubber, uh, extraction of, of uh, latex from rubber tree, uh, hunting, fishing, and extractivism in general. Here, I will focus in two examples, the Arapaima, and uh, community-based management of Arapaima, and also uh, the community-based management of the giant turtle in Amazonia. So the Arapaima, it's very interesting case. Arapaima is the largest uh, freshwater scaled fish on earth, which can reach up to three meters and 200 kilos. And this fish is very important for local culture in terms of cosmology, in terms of uh, food security, in terms of economy. So due to its very, very high importance, the Arapaima was overfished over the la last century, uh, being almost extinct in many localities. Uh, so to reverse this, uh, this pattern of population decline, local communities in partnership with researchers from uh, Instituto Mamirawa started to develop the community-based management of Arapaima, which is a, a simple model where local community ensures the spatial zoning of fisheries. So they uh, establish in the, in the riverscape open access lakes where the commercial fishes, uh, fishing is allowed subsistence lakes where only subsistence fisheries can occur for local communities and the protected lakes where the fishery is not allowed, is forbidden, but on year they can do uh, their opinion management. So basically uh, local communities build wood house in the entrance of the lakes and they protect this environment uh, across the years, you know, avoiding uh, illegal fishers and, and poachers. Um, so just to, to illustrate how is the protection, we have the landscape with hundreds of lakes and they choose some lakes to protect where they build this wood house and start the protection. The results for conservation is incredible, uh, as I, I will show. And ah, one, one important thing, 
the arapaima evolved in a in an environment with a very low concentration of oxygen. So um, it's a, a, a air breathing fish. So the arapaima need to come to the surface to capture the oxygen. And during this process, experienced fishers can count the number of arapaima in each lake. I don't know if you can see, but this is a, a video just to show the exact moment where the arapaima uh, come to the surface to get the, the oxygen. Yes, in the, in the left corner. So you can see, and during this moment, the arapaima can be counted. So uh, local community used to count the arapaima every year in these lakes. So based on the number uh, of the arapaima and in the population recovery, the Brazilian government can allow a fishing quota that can be harvested by local communities. Just to, to illustrate the, the, the management, here we have the fishes harvested, the fishing processing in the local, local communities, and then the products that comes to the, the consumers. And how is the conservation outcomes in this arrangement? Well, this is super interesting. The first question is try to understand the effect of local protection on these lakes. In protected lakes, we have uh, an average of 500, more than 500 Arapaima compared with the open access lakes where we have only nine Arapaima per lake in average. And subsistence lakes is, is in, the, in the middle with 34 individuals per lake. So there is a very strong effect of local protection in the population size of the Arapaima. And this is very interesting because it can result in a trophic dynamic. For example, in the places where the, uh, in protected lakes, in the right side here in my presentation, we have a high number of arapaima. So we have a strong pressure in planktivagus fish. So we, we have a decrease in the biomass of these planktivagus fish and we, uh, an increase in the biomass of zooplankton. And then the zooplankton decrease the biomass of phytoplankton. So the primary production of these protected lakes is lower compared to open access lakes. In open access lakes, uh, we do not have this top predator like Arapaima. So we have a higher biomass of planktophagus fishes, a lower biomass of zooplankton, and then resulting in a, in a higher biomass of phytoplankton. So it's a very interesting because it's like a win-win model where we have protected lakes with high value fishes and unprotected lakes where we do not have these high value fishes, but we have a, a higher uh, primary production and therefore a higher biomass of detritivorous fish which is very important for local subsistence. Um, modeling the, the population size of, of Arapaima, um, we see that the local protection is the most important variable. So um, local protection is the most important factor to explain the population size uh, of Arapaima, undermining uh, even the environmental uh, factors. And the Arapaima is also an umbrella species. By protecting the environments where the, the, the Arapaima lives, we can ensure the protection of many other species, including turtles and caimans. So, um, Another question that we used to say uh, is, this model can work outside protected areas because the Arapaima management was developed inside protected areas. So we did an experiment by implementing this model with disenfranchised communities outside 
uh, protected areas. And the results were was really, really interesting because the, we can see a, a very strong pattern of population recovery of Arapaima. So uh, doesn't matter if the model is inside or outside protected area. The important issue is the local protection of those lakes. So uh, in 11 years of Arapaima management, inside protected areas, uh, the population size of Arapaima increased 425%. And outside protected areas, in five years, uh, the population size increased almost 400%. So it's, it's very interesting in terms of um, conservation because Arapaima is an iconic, uh, uh, iconic species uh, that was overfished and now local communities are bringing it back from the brink. And this model also ensures many uh, important economic benefits uh, for example, these protected lakes use to work as uh, a bank account where the local communities can access on per year. So which ensures a strong social security for those communities. For example, last year, we had three examples of cancer in these rural communities and people were sent to Manaus to receive the health treatment through the Arapaima management. Like 10 years ago, these people would die in the bank with the river without opportunity uh, of healthcare. And, and we show through predictive models that this is a very, very uh, um, promising strategy to improve the local uh, quality of life because when you start to protect the, a lake, to protect a lake, you will spend like seven or eight years by protecting, and then you will achieve a population size of a thousand Arapaima, which can generate uh, an income of $30,000 per year. So it's really, really uh, relevant in terms of uh, income generation in, in Amazonia. And also, uh, Arapaima has been helping with the global fight against gender inequality. For a long time, women are involved in fisheries, but the income goes every time to their husband's hands. Now, within the Arapaima model, women are playing a specific role in the management, so they are receiving their own income, which can improve the, the autonomy with, with women and, and, and also the freedom. So it's, it's very interesting. And here we can see some women involved in the Arapana management. And there are other social benefits, includes income for youth, collective investments, uh, cultural maintenance, and also the sense of the proud, the increasing on the self-esteem of, of the, the local communities. So we used to say that the Arapaima is the fish of change, which have been ensuring the protection of the biodiversity, but also uh, inducing a social transformation in the, in the rural Amazonia. And the another case that I would like to share with you is the community-based management of freshwater turtles, which is a, also a, a very emblematic case. Uh, freshwater turtles are very important uh, for people from Amazonia in terms of local culture, economy, and also food. It's a very important uh, food resource. And, and the model, it's very similar to the Arapaima, but it's not about lakes, but about sand beaches. During the dry season, we have these sand beaches in the, in the, in the landscape where turtle used to reproduce. 
So in one single beach is like, like this one in the victory, you can have like 2000 turtles uh, building their nests and, and the hatchlings coming from the, from the systems. So, and, and the turtle is a very important resource, as I said, for example, one single turtle can be sold in Manaus, for example, which is the biggest city in Amazonia, uh, for like three or four hundred dollars. So uh, during the, the, the reproduction season of the turtles, these beaches are uh, very, very, they receive a very strong pressure from illegal fishers that try to, to get these turtles to, to sell in the urban centers. So just to show how it's work in the front line, here's a, a small video and you can see a small crops here. And then in front of the house, the, the, the beach that are protected. And here are very simple and humble uh, wood house where people stay during the dry season to protect the environment. Um, I used to say that in terms of conservation, these people are truly heroes because they, they stay most of their times protecting the nature. It's a very dangerous activity because sometimes they need to be there with gums uh, against local uh, illegal fishers. But the result for conservation is it's really, really strong. For example, in terms of conservation outcomes, in protected beaches, we have almost 60 fold more nests in those protected beaches. And at the same time, the poaching activity is much lower. In unprotected beaches, 99% uh, of the, the nests are harvested by, by locals, illegal fishers, compared only, uh, to only 2% in protected beaches. So the impact of this local protection in the conservation of the, the giant turtle in Amazonia is really, really uh, strong. And this is very interesting because this is an umbrella uh, strategy as well. So by protecting the, these sand beaches, they are protecting many other species, including Amazonian manatees, other species of turtles. This program is focused on, on the giant turtle, but there are other smaller species that also use the, the, the beaches. Also the large catfishes, migratory birds, like black skimmers, Orinoco goose, um, caimans, and even invertebrates. We have three folds more uh, biomass of invertebrates in protected beaches. So uh, for migratory birds, it's, it's really, really incredible. For example, um, less than 10% of the sand beaches of the Jurua River are protected by local communities. But this small number of beaches host more than 85% of the, the migratory individuals that come to reproduce in, in, in this river. So the impact of local protection of these beaches in migratory birds is really, really remarkable. And we analyzed 40 years of this, this model and we see that the number of nests per beach has increased uh, 11 fold. So these local people are also contributing with the, the population recovery of these emblematic species. So going back to our question, can we put together nature and people in the same conservation package? Um, I, I believe that 
this is the, the only way to ensure a, a sustainable future for Amazonia is to, to handle um, the social aspiration of local communities. We have been implementing a, a large scale project where the idea is to develop a river basin model of conservation and, and local development in Amazonia. The idea is to work with sustainable riverscapes that can be replicated uh, to, other, to other river basins. And there is a, a researcher that I, I like that he used to say, the, the Ratan Lao, he used to say that when people are poverty stricken, desperate and starving, they, they pass on their sufferings to the land. And I believe that this is very important to think the conservation in, in Amazonia, because we cannot, uh, it's very hard to think in the, in the protection of biodiversity without uh, the local community. So um, we created, um, Years ago, we created an organization that's called Instituto Juruá, where the idea is to work with community-based solutions for Amazonia. So we have been working in this design uh, of community-based conservation models, uh, not only for aquatic species, but also for terrestrial species. The idea is, is to strengthen the, the biodiversity value chains and improve the commercialization bottlenecks towards a sustainable uh, fair trade. So we have a, a, a large team we working with uh, conservation interventions and also with research. And the idea is to build also a, a, a research environment that can receive people uh, around the world uh, to conduct the research, but also to, to visit this place and these livelihoods such as the, the Arapaima management, to understand how it's work, to see the impact of, of the conservation in the, in the front line. When you enter in protected lakes, it's, it's very beautiful because it's like a, a, a biodiverse island with many, many species. So you can really see the impact of the local protection. Uh, so I think that the most important message from, from these models is uh, well-established community-based conservation can align social needs and, and biodiversity protection. Uh, local ecological knowledge is fundamental to understand the socioecology of Amazonia. Uh, most of these examples come from the integration between uh, local knowledge and scientific knowledge. So really, we really need to, um, to create new environments where we can put together the scientific knowledge and the local uh, knowledge of local community in Amazonia. Uh, contrary to the gloom and doom narrative, I think that um, this is a bright case, in, in, a bright spot in Amazonia where we can show that local people are part of the conservation solutions. Yeah? And, and this is very interesting because sometimes for researchers and conservationists, conservation is something at the end that you need to achieve. But we believe that conservation should be a way of life, uh, should be the, the, the pathway uh, where people can improve their lives, but also uh, recognizing the importance to protect the nature. Uh, and it's not only about social justice, but it's also about conservation uh, effectiveness. Each day we have more robust evidence that when you include local people 
in the conservation paradigm. You can go longer, you can achieve better outcomes, better outputs, and so that's it. This is the, the Instituto Juruá. Please, if you have some question, uh, just make contact with us. It's a pleasure to establish a new contact. And, and thank, thank you very much. I'm completely available uh, to, to start a discussion and a, a conversation. So firstly, um, I just want to say a huge thank you for, for giving this talk, Shatabe. That's awesome. Uh, it's really lovely to see that work. Um, I just want like one like a quick disclosure. This is a, a topic that's very dear and close to my heart uh, because I was doing my um, my PhD in the Juruá with um, what was then the Projeto Medio Juruá, which is now the Instituto Juruá. Um, so this landscape and the these kind of conservation stories are something which which mean a lot to me personally. Um, are you, do you have time for some questions? For sure, I'm completely available. Okay. Uh, well, I can. I'll maybe start us. I'll start the ball the ball rolling with the questions. So, mm -hmm. firstly, this sounds like a very optimistic um, example where you're having high conservation benefits and you're also having high community benefits. You know, that's the dream for wildlife conservationists. And a lot of conservationists struggle to, to make that happen. What factors do you think have led to this, um, this, these projects being so successful when other conservation projects have found it so hard to get those co-benefits? Yeah. Yeah, actually, this is a very important question, and this is one of the central, the central subjects that we are trying to address with new research, because um, to ensure the success of, of a community-based arrangement, basically, we have ecological principles, institutional and social principles that are very important to 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 ensure um, these outcomes. For example, in terms of uh, ecological principles, it's very important to have um, well-defined boundaries. In this case, for example, we have a well-defined uh, environment that will be protected, like the lakes or the beaches. It's very important because. Um, local people can monopolize this environment, the, the, this protection. So another issue that is very important is to work with culturally important species. By working with culturally important species, people are really engaged with, with the project because people uh, recognize the importance of those species uh, for the local culture, and, and this is very, very important. And of course, the size of the resource is also important. The size of resource means that the resource can be um, economically exploited. So people should have the benefits because they are putting a very strong effort in the project. So the income generation, it's, it's very important as well. And to have the income generation, you need to, to harvest like a, a, a resource that has a, a high um, population size, if you want. And there are also some social principles and institutional principles. For example, the presence of strong leadership. Um, strong leaders can increase the engagement of the local communities in the process of the protection, uh, the respect of local norms, the local rules. People need to, to feel that they are part of the solution and they are in front of the model, you know? It, it's much more about a, a bottom-up initiative 
uh, other than a top-down initiative. So it, it, it is very important. The inclusion of local people in decision-making, uh, clear regulation, people need to know very clearly what they need to do, um, what can happen if they do not respect the rules, and also what we, we used to say as a, a polycentric governance. We need different organizations working in different environments of decision making. This is very important because it can help to strengthen the activity as a whole, but also to ensure the regulation of the activity. The regulation is very important and it's important that this regulation uh, is also conducted by external actors, not only the, uh, the local community. So we are still conducting this kind of, of studies to understand the, the most important ingredients to ensure these, these conservation benefits. But I think that there are many different principles that can, that should be in the project to increase the likelihood of the success. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. And that's a lot of different elements. I've got a follow up question. If not, if um, we've not got more questions coming sure. in. So that's so that's really interesting to think about those factors which might be responsible for the success of these projects. But it's notable that the examples you've given are aquatic or aquatic adjacent uh, systems and projects. And what you're looking to do next is to move into terrestrial systems, uh, so land-based systems away from the river, from the rivers and the lakes. What kind of additional challenges do you foresee trying to apply this to terrestrial systems, and how do you think you might be able to overcome some of those? Yeah, this is a wonderful question because we are really trying to understand how can we replicate this model with uh, terrestrial uh, research. And I think, Mark, the most important thing that we need to develop is uh, a strategy to ensure the spatial zoning of terrestrial activity. Because in this, in this example of aquatic species, we can ensure the spatial zoning of the, uh, uh, of the, the, the activity by protecting some lakes, but how can we, we get these areas in the terrestrial, which is uh, much more like an open, open, uh, <coughs> sorry, the term in English is, uh, I forgot, but is much more an open system that is, is really hard to define up. Here we have a protected place, here is not protect. So it's hard because we, not, we do not have like the discrete units in the landscape. So the idea is to, we have a, a official a tool in Brazilian government, which is called fishing agreement, where we can uh, conduct the spatial zoning and people can be empowered, officially empowered to protect that environment. So that's a, a very uh, big challenge that we have for natural resource. How can we conduct the spatial zoning of the activity? Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense um, in terms of theories that people come, have come up with about the management of open access resources. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. We have a question from Mark Eisler who asks, what are the barriers to scaling this initiative to wider or additional areas? Uh, this is a great question, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, um, the Arab Prime started in one single community 20 years ago. Now we have the Arapaima management in more than um, 500 communities. So um, the potential to scale up the model is really, really high. Uh, but one huge barrier, I think, is the funding because to implement this initiative, we need to work uh, several years with local communities by providing training and, you know, 
this is a, a part of Amazonia very neglected, so people do not have access to, to formal education. So we need to start a project since the beginning, work with concepts, so sometimes it takes time. And so it's not so easy to find funding to, to work uh, with this kind of project. But so I, I see the potential to, to scale up for a much larger scale in Amazonia, but it will take time, you know, because first of all, people, local people need to see that conservation can uh, improve their, their lives because sometimes in Amazonia, conservation is related, it's a very negative word. People used to think, ah, conservation uh, will, uh, will not benefit my life. So you need to change the local perception and start to work very slowly with local communities. So I think this is a, 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 a huge challenge that we have. Thanks, um, Mark, that was a really great question. Thank you for that. Um, th there was just a technical point um, that you made that I just thought maybe would be worth clarifying for the audience. Um, you talked about white water rivers and black water rivers, Avasia and so forth. And I, I think maybe some of the audience won't necessarily know the difference. Would you mind just briefly explaining what the difference is between a white water and a black water river? Yeah, sure. Yeah, this is a uh, this is very interesting in Amazonia. Um, white water, it's it's a, a a water water with a high concentration of nutrients and sediments and sediments. These rivers, white water rivers, used to to born in the Andes mountain, in the western of Amazonia, and they are very very productive. We have a very high a biomass of fishy. Uh, since uh, fishes, mosquitoes, uh, mammals, and, and even uh, local communities, human communities, and, and black water are different. Uh, they are very, very uh, poor in nutrients and has this dark color of the water. So the biomass of fish is lower. Um, the, the rivers has another origins is not come from the Andes, so there's no uh, a, a high concentration of nutrients. And it's a very, very different environment. Thank you. That's, um, yeah, thanks for that really good, that good summary. Um, we've got time for another question if anyone wants to ask one, but I just want to, I don't know if, if you realize, but uh, Jotabe is actually is, is online from Brazil here, so you're really lucky you've got, you've got a speaker from, from halfway across the world. Um, Anne P asks, a point of detail, important for ensuring your statistics are correct, when fishermen count the arapaima, um, it's called a contagi, uh, as they surface, how do they know they are not counting the same individual number of times? Uh, that's great, and this is a, a great question. Sorry, it's very, very quickly that we, uh, sometimes we do not provide, provide the correct the details. But actually, there are uh, plenty of studies showing that the pattern of the, um, the, the arapaima breathing is, uh, occurs in, the, in 20 minutes. So each 20 minutes, the fish come to the surface to, to get there. So basically, they put fishers across the whole river and they conduct the counting for 20 minutes. You know, and this estimates the errors in this estimate. There are many studies with um, with mark capture and release of fishes showing that the arapaima county has a, a, a error lower than 10% of the real population size. So there are different statistical studies showing uh, these methods and showing how how these methods was built. Brilliant. That's a really good question. Um, nice, a nice detailed technical question. And thanks exactly. for that explanation. I love it. Okay. Um, if we've not got further questions for now, then it just remains for me to say again, uh, Jotabe, 
I'm uh, incredibly grateful that you've come and spent your time giving us this talk this evening. Thank you very much.